now see the title screen of the talk. As Mark said, I've done a, a, a number of different talks because I regard myself as a jack of all trades. I know a lot about, uh, I know a little about lots of different things, but not necessarily a lot about one particular thing. So I certainly don't regard myself as an expert on dragonflies. I'm sure there'll be people listening to this who probably know uh, more about them than me. But nevertheless, it's a fascinating subject, uh, and I'll tell you what I do know. As I said to the Conway branch uh, 12 months ago when I did the talk on moths, you, some of you who saw that may remember that I'm not a photographer either, really. Uh, and this was my study of a kingfisher, which some of you might remember me showing to you. There's the kingfisher uh, down there. Uh, and my talents haven't really improved in that respect. So this is my uh, study of a curlew on the beach there. See, So don't, uh, don't expect too much photography-wise. But dragonflies, let's start on the dragonflies. They're a fascinating group of insects. They're known as the birders' insect for two reasons, really. They're the uh, closest flying things there are to birds in terms of the size, the biggest insects we've got. But also, the peak season for dragonflies is really in July. And July is the time for birders when the spring migrants have all arrived, the autumn migration hasn't started yet. And so, when things quieten down a bit for the bird watchers, the dragonflies provide a, a, a nice aspect to watch. 46 breeding species at the moment, and that's an increase. There was only 38 in 2002 and dragonflies are benefiting from climate change. So particularly in the south and southeast of England, uh, we've got some species which are trying to get a foothold in the UK. They're not all necessarily succeeding in, in terms of um, breeding year on year, but certainly last year there were 46 breeding species. They're suffering, of course, a lot of good news that we've got more species coming. Generally speaking, in terms of the numbers of dragonflies, uh, we haven't got as many as we used to. They suffer from the same sort of habitat loss as butterflies. And in fact, because of so many ponds are being lost, that's affected dragonflies particularly. One of the interesting things is that old records for dragonflies aren't as extensive as butterflies. The reason for that is butterflies and moths, of course, have scales on their wings. And when they're dead, the colour is retained on those scales. So for people to collect them and put them in cabinets, the Edwardians and Victorians especially concentrated on uh, butterflies and moths. When dragonflies are dead, they have no scales and so they lose the pigment from their bodies and so we're never as attractive for people to collect them. And interestingly again, it wasn't until 1977 with a book by Cyril Hammond who worked at the Natural History Museum in London that the uh, British names were uh, agreed upon. Names of dragonflies are still controversial. They are the order, Odonata. Odonata means the toothed ones, referring to the mandibles that the, these predators have. And the UK dragonflies are divided into two suborders. They are the Zygoptera, which are the damselflies, and the Anisoptera. Now, what do we call the Anisoptera? They're dragonflies as well. So we have the strange situation in the UK where the order's name is the same as the suborder's name, and that can cause some confusion. In America, they call the Anisoptera the warrior flies, uh, and there is a lobby from certain groups in the UK to start using that terminology, simply so that it's a bit clearer. The damsel flies are uh, weaker flyers. They're much more delicate insects than the, uh, the anisoptera. They hold, zygoptera by the way, means unequal wings. I beg your pardon, sorry, equal wings. So the, the wings of the damsel flies are the same shape, uh, by and large the same size, and they hold them along the abdomen there, all except for uh, one family of them, uh, parallel along the body. Whereas the anisoptera, that means unequal wings, they hold their wings at right angles to the body and the fore and rear wings are different sizes and different shapes. They have this curved uh, inner edge to the rear wings which allows the females to grab hold of them when they're in the mating position, more of which later. 
The other main difference uh, is the eyes. So on the Anisoptera, all except one species, have the eyes touching in the centre. Whereas for the Zygoptera, the damselflies, they have what's known as dumbbell eyes. So if you imagine that shape there as a rectangle, the eyes are at either end of the rectangle. So quite distinct types of eyes that they have. But the eyes of all dragonflies are phenomenal, really. They're compound eyes, and they have up to 30,000 different facets in their eyes. When I counted this one, I could only count 27,622, but you might like to check that later on. But uh, lots and lots of facets in these eyes, which gives them wonderful sight. It's very difficult to creep up on a dragonfly. If you want to photograph one that's at rest, they see you, you know, from whatever angle you approach. So not easy to photograph. The Anisoptera, uh, there are five families that comprise that suborder. The hawker dragonflies, the, the biggest and heaviest of the group, the ones that people think of as dragonflies. There's one species, golden ring dragonfly. The emerald dragonflies, which you are unlikely to see anywhere in Wales. The club tail dragonflies, one quite rare species in the UK. And the biggest group, the Libellulidae, the chasers, the skimmers, and the darters. It's a big family worldwide. The Zygoptera, just four families, two species of Demoiselle. The uh, biggest group, the Coenagrionidae, the familiar blue black damselflies, uh, and also the red ones. The emerald damselflies, not to be confused with the emerald dragonflies. Emerald damsels are fairly widespread in Wales. Uh, and a single species of white-legged damsels. But it's the life cycle of dragonflies which I find so fascinating. Some people say uh, the life cycle of dragonflies epitomizes the whole of evolution on Earth, because life on Earth began in the seas, moved to the land and then to the air. And that's exactly what the dragonfly life cycle does. So it starts with the egg, uh, they then move to the larva or nymph, straight to the adult. The, it's called uh, hem, the hemimetabolus, or incomplete metamorphosis. There's only three stages. Unlike, for example, butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, which have the fourth part of the life cycle, they have a pupa. There's no pupal stage in the, uh, in the dragonfly life cycle, so it's incomplete metamorphosis. They, uh, although they're fierce predators in the ponds and the waters in which they live, they of course have their own predators. And this little sequence I thought might just be interesting to show you. I photographed this in a pond I had in Rossus a couple of years ago, where a great water diving beetle had uh, a common darter larva from the pond. And this is in the center of the pond, which is about uh, eight or nine feet in diameter. But somehow or another, the, uh, the larva managed to struggle to the side where I put some mats down to help little froglets uh, get out of the pond more easily. Uh, but this commotion that the diving beetle was causing attracted some of the smooth newts that were in the pond. And the smooth newts in turn drove the beetle away and this poor little thing was then started to be eaten <laughs> by the newts itself. It eventually managed to climb up uh, this matting there, but I'm afraid that uh, I didn't hold out a great deal of hope for it. So, these little cameos that you see, not just in ponds, but in wildlife generally, is what makes wildlife fascinating, isn't it? You never know what you're going to see. But if anyone's ever just watched uh, a larvae emerge in the emergent vegetation from the pond, it takes about two hours, uh, thereabouts, for a dragonfly to change, uh, break out of its larval case, uh, and emerge in this uh, phenomenal sequence, which happens early morning, often in uh, uh, an easterly facing part of the pond where it's gonna get the sunlight so that it has time during the day to mature. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing to watch. Uh, it, it does have a sort of a prehistoric sense to it, it seems to me. And of course, uh, these creatures have been on the earth for 350 million years, but it's uh, just a, a wonderful thing to see. And of course, when they've hatched out, they leave behind these, uh, these exoskeletons, these exuvii, as they're called, um, and the, uh, you can always see the hole in the back where they've emerged from the case. Uh, and in fact, 
uh, if I can. I'm, I'm, this is the first time I've done one of these virtual talks, but I'm going to try and come out of this in a minute just to show you that you can collect these uh, exuvii, and it's quite fascinating. You can actually not only tell which species of dragon, can you see them? Uh, not only tell which species of dragonfly they are from the exuvia, you can actually tell the sex of the creature as well. Uh, I'll go back to the sharing again to show you that in fact there is uh, an excellent book now that will identify these uh, field guide to identify the exuvii. Uh, and it's just really interesting. It's, it's much better incidentally, if you're trying to survey a particular water to find out what the populations of Odonata are within that body of water, the best way of doing it is actually to monitor the exuvii because many of the species will fly away from the water uh, when they've emerged. Um, and certainly one for the club tail, which we'll talk a bit more about later, most of them will just fly away as soon as the wings have hardened. And so if you're monitoring it by looking at the adults that are in the vicinity, it, it's nowhere near as exact a science as actually monitoring the number of exuvii that are there. They'll last quite a long time if there's no rain, um, and they, uh, as I say, they're a really good indication of the, of the dragonfly population. As to the actual mating cycle of, uh, for the dragonflies, when they begin to mate, the male, uh, this is the male of the common data here, will grasp the female behind the head uh, with his claspers, the anal appendages at the end of his abdomen here. In the damselflies, uh, they will um, grasp what's called the pronotum, which is the, a, a, a scaly patch just behind the head here. But the, the anisoptera are all grasp just behind the head of the female. And when they're in this position, it's called in tandem, for obvious reasons. They then form what's called the wheel position, where the female curls her abdomen around to the, uh, just behind the, 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 the thorax here of the male. Here's the, uh, the damselflies in a wheel, wheel position where you might be able to see that the pronotum there that's being grasped rather than the head itself. Uh, and the female can grasp the male in slightly uh, different positions with the legs. So the legs of these migrant hawkers here, the female quite uh, high up towards the thorax, whereas on the common darters here, not quite so far. Uh, but the, it, what's unique about dragonflies is that the males have two sets of genitalia. Now, well, that's, that's interesting, isn't it? They have a primary set, which is uh, at the end of the abdomen here, and they have a secondary set of genitalia, which is just here, just behind the thorax. Uh, before they mate, the male will transfer the sperm package from the end of his primary genitalia and transfer it to the secondary, where the female picks it up. The dragonflies can be in this position, in this wheel position, for either just a few seconds, or in fact for many hours. Where they are uh, in the wheel position for that sort of length of time, it's often because the male, again unique amongst dragonflies, will have excavated from the female any sperm that might have been deposited there from another male with a previous mating. So he'll scrape out that sperm before he then in inserts his own sperm in order to make sure that it's he is the father of any offspring. So absolutely fascinating mating cycle. Once the, uh, the mating has taken place and they're ready to lay eggs or oviposited, again, there are different ways in which that's done. Uh, most of the damselflies will remain in the tandem position uh, and the female can actually submerge completely underneath the water while she lays her eggs uh, and the male will stay with her. The uh, Libelle Ulidae will often just uh, dip, the female will dip her abdomen into the water to drop the eggs there and sometimes they'll be beyond the, the water itself but the male will uh, usually stay with the female still in tandem whereas for the hawkers for example the female will usually lay her eggs just by herself uh, and the male can hover uh, and be round and about to protect 
because as we've just heard, you know, uh, uh, another male might come along and, and, uh, and, and mate again. So the males may still be staying around, but the hawkers will, uh, will lay separately. This is a brown hawker. Uh, this is a Norfolk hawker. And some of the, uh, the Anisoptera have this blade here. The female has a blade at the end of the abdomen where she'll make a little slit in the vegetation before she lays her eggs. And sometimes the eggs will be laid, not in the water itself, but in the surrounding vegetation. Uh, Southern hawkers, for example, quite a common species, are renowned for uh, laying their eggs in vegetation just above the water line. So now a little bit of, uh, of ID, a few ID tips for people often find that the, uh, these black and blue damselflies, two species of which are extremely common uh, and people often just give up trying to identify them because of the difficulty. Superficially, they look extremely similar. Um, you see them in great clouds on, in the right habitat on, on, uh, on sunny days. And both the azure damselfly and the common blue damselfly are equally as common in, in the area. And so there's a few tips here on how to tell the azure blue uh, damselfly from the common blue damselfly. Uh, and pay attention, you may all be tested on this at the end. And there are three features that uh, distinguish them. Segment two on, on most of the damselfly species is, a, is a, a key identification feature. So all the odonars have nine segments to the abdomen and segment two on the damsels is a key feature. And on the azure, it has what's known as the whiskey glass black mark on the blue, the whiskey glass. Uh, secondly, these stripes on the thorax are called anti-humeral stripes and they're quite narrow on the azure damsel. And the third feature, not just on the azure, but on all the Coenagrian species, of which there are a number in the UK, is this little black spur there, which is called the Coenagrian spur. It's common to those damsels. The common blue has what's called a golf tee pattern on the second segment. It has broad anti humor stripes and no spur, just a, th a black thoracic stripe. So when you see the two together, those three things. There's the spur, which is missing from the common. Notice the difference between the two anti-humeral stripes and the whiskey glass is there, the whiskey glass mark and the common. So uh, hopefully that will help. They're not always to see with the naked eye, but if you have a pair of binoculars, it's the whiskey glass there on the second segment which is the feature I think most people tend to see first, be able to look for first. But how do you remember that it's the whiskey glass that says it's the azure and not the other way around? Well, that's simple. As you're having a glass of whiskey, I might as well have one too. So there we are, that's how you remember. And after all that ID stuff, there's a little joke. Went into a pet shop and asked for a dozen bees. The shopkeeper counted 13 and handed them over. I said, you'd give me one too many. The shopkeeper said, the last one is a freebie. That was just a little interlude after all that difficult ID stuff. Moving on. So here's some of the other UK Zygoptera. I'm not like that joke, I can sing it. He likes bees. Uh, the beautiful damoiselle. Uh, now these two species, the beautiful damoiselle and the banded damoiselle, and they really are beautiful, aren't they? Both of them are beautiful. Uh, this metallic, uh, lustrous abdomen and thorax that the males have, uh, and these dark wings. But they're species that like uh, running water, so both of them are fairly common, I know, on the Allen, for example, uh, and they're both widespread in Wales, but beautiful not quite so much as the banded. The banded is more common, but gorgeous species. The males are quite easy to tell apart. This band on the male is very distinctive. Females, like lots of the uh, dragonflies, aren't as easy. So that's the beautiful and that's the uh, banded and they look very similar. In actual fact, it's the, uh, this wing mark that is the best distinguishing feature. But I'm not going to go into uh, ID of female Odonata on this talk, otherwise we'd be here all day. The females can be quite difficult. It's also interesting to think that 
because of the incomplete metamorphosis, when dragonflies hatch out from their exuvia, they are immature, they, they, they don't have the full colours that the adults will. So as well as having the differences between males and females across different species, when a, a dragonfly is immature, it also looks quite different, which just adds to the, uh, the difficulty in identifying some of these creatures. But this one is fairly uh, easy to identify, not least because it's the earliest one of all the Odonata to emerge. Uh, they are often on the wing in March, and I think this year they actually appeared uh, towards the south of England in as early as February. Uh, and it's one of the longest of the, uh, of the damselflies, uh, and it's a very pretty one. Because it's got a long abdomen, it often forms a beautiful heart shape when it's in the wheel position which, uh, as you might imagine, has given rise to all sorts of sentimental comments about when they're mating, they actually, they actually form a heart. Then we've got the annual damselfly. Now, this is the exception to the rule about damselflies holding their wings along the abdomen, parallel to the abdomen. And indeed, in, uh, in the States, the annual damselflies, of which there are a few different species, uh, they're actually called spread wings. Uh, and I think uh, Alan Brandon, our, our, our dragonfly recorder in Wales, actually likes to use that terminology for them as well. A uh, very pretty damselfly, fairly widespread in, in Wales, and the males have this beautiful powder blue thorax uh, and, and bits on, on, on their abdomen. Very pretty. Uh, and they'll often uh, oviposit, as these pair are doing, in, uh, in vegetation that's slightly above the water line. Then we've got uh, another incredibly common damsel, the blue-tailed damselfly, which is fairly readily uh, identifiable, as its name suggests, with its blue tail. Uh, one of the first species to colonize a new pond. It does have a cousin, which is called a scarce blue tail. Uh, and this is recognized by eight and nine segment so blue far more blue on both eight and nine whereas the common blue tail just has the uh, the blue on its on its uh, segment nine so not easy to identify those two but the scarce blue tail has a very distinctive immature female form uh, this lovely orange color or antiarcha it's called and it was because it's so distinctive that it was seen in our new reserve at Minera a few years ago. Uh, and some of you will know Andrew Graham, who uh, runs the North Wales Lepidopterous site. He's bought some land adjacent to the Minera Reserve, which is managing uh, in harmony with us, with the North Wales Wildlife Trust. And he subsequently found it on his land. And in fact, he believes that this uh, damselfly is far more numerous than, than has been recorded. Uh, that's the mature female, by the way. Uh, it tends to like um, ephemeral ponds and successional ponds. So you can find it in places where it hasn't necessarily been before. Uh, and you can see from that distribution map that across Wales as a whole, uh, in contradiction really to uh, many other parts of the UK, it's fairly well distributed. So it's one that's worth looking out for, I think, if you're out on your travels, flying at the moment. Then a quite a distinctive species, the red-eyed damselfly, uh, which again, in terms of its distribution, is moving westwards, and it's just starting to move across the borders into Wales. I discovered this in Chlai uh, pools near Wrexham uh, a few years ago, first time it had been recorded there. It likes to sit on floating vegetation, lily pads, uh, water hawthorn, that sort of thing. So uh, it's not only the red eyes, but this, the top of its thorax looks completely black when you see it, which is quite a distinctive feature. The white-legged damselfly is being monitored at the moment by the British Dragonfly Society. They're trying to find out just uh, how widespread it is, because again, it's a, it's a species moving west from the UK into Wales, uh, and it, it's worth looking out for. Quite distinctive, really. It looks much paler than lots of the other damsels, and uh, as its name suggests, it has white legs. Small red damselfly is quite a scarce species. 
It's found in parts of mid and southern Wales, but also uh, in the Fens and Marshes in Anglesey. So if you're in Anglesey, that's one worth looking out for. Uh, the large red has black on the thorax, whereas the small red is almost entirely red like that. And then this is a bit of an awkward one, the varial damselfly. It's one of the Coenagrian species, so it does have this Coenagrian spur, uh, like the azure. But it's variable, so the markings on its thorax especially, and in this segment too, can be variable, which makes it a bit of a pain. Uh, it often has what's known as these dragon's teeth anti-humeral stripes on its thorax and you can see here in this uh, mating pair uh, but again it's not a terribly common one especially over in, in the west part of the UK um, it's in parts of southern Wales but it is in Anglesey uh, and this pair was photographed by me in Cosgoch you find it in Erthreniog and Bordelio so in the fens and marshes of Anglesey it's reasonably locally common but by far uh, a common species UK wide. And this is a really rare species, the southern damselfly. Another Coenagrian, the third Coenagrian species that we can see in Wales. Uh, it has what's known as the mercury mark, the second uh, segment on the, on the abdomen looks like the symbol for mercury, is what people say. So that's the, that's the thing to look out for. Uh, and it flies in Anglesey, but look how scarce it is across the UK as a whole. A few colonies in southern Wales, but it's around the fens and marshes in Anglesey. So if you're out looking for rarities, that's the one to look for. Uh, this is just to tell me, could look at the clock to say it's about halfway-ish. So if you're tired, or if you're bored, or if you've got egrets about joining in, now's the time to go and make a little cup of tea or whatever. Uh, and we'll move on to the Anisoptera. Now, just like there's confusion uh, about the black and blue damsels, there are three species of Anisoptera, the big hawker dragonflies, that people often get confused about. So I thought I'd just uh, perhaps give what, what I find, a little mnemonic, a little remembering tip. Uh, these are the sort of mid to late summer flyers. We've got here the, uh, the common hawker, I beg your pardon, let's go back one, the common hawker there, the uh, southern hawker and the migrant hawker. Now the common hawker, first of all, it has yellow costas. Now the costa is the leading edge of the wings here. So if you've got one of these hawkers flying around, the first thing to look for is the costa and they're actually quite visible when they're flying and it's most usual to see these creatures in flight you know if you see one perched uh, then, then you're doing quite well you normally see them flying past so those yellow costas will tell you that it is a common hawker so costa common it's that alliteration which hopefully will uh, just you know uh, remember help you remember that that's what it is the second species is the southern hawker. Now, these are the ones that you may have had this happen to you late summer. This big dragonfly will actually often come right up to you and have a nose. They're incredibly inquisitive. And that is one of the distinguishing features. And just by the fact that it's coming up to have a little nose at who you are would indicate that it's likely to be a southern hawker. But they have what are known as headlamps these anti-humeral stripes, which are more like big yellow blobs that people say look like headlamps of a car coming straight towards you. So headlamps, southern, is another part of that little mnemonic to help you remember. And then finally, oh, I beg your pardon, that was, a, that was a, what's called a teneral dragonfly. So a teneral uh, dragonfly or damselfly is one that is newly hatched and it has a pearly sort of opalescent appearance to the wings. Uh, the third species of the confusion species is the migrant hawker. Superficially all these three hawks look the same but uh, if you've ruled out the common because it hasn't got yellow costas and it hasn't got these big yellow headlamps then it's likely to be a migrant. The migrant hawkers fly very late into the year. You can see these flying in uh, November 
and they often form quite big groups, often at the tops of trees in woodlands. You'll see these groups of hawkers, and they're likely to be migrants. But migrants have this little yellow triangle on the thorax, so migrant triangle. We've got cost of for common lamps for southern and migrant for triangle. So uh, no doubt you'll all remember this when you get to uh, July and August, and you'll know exactly what these big hawkers are. So here's a hawker that's got yellowish costa, it's got headlamps of a source, and it's got a yellow mark that looks a bit like the triangle. It's got all three of those, but this is actually a hairy dragonfly. It's actually a bit smaller than the other three, and what will distinguish this one more than anything else is the fact it's the earliest of the big hawkers to, to fly. So you'll see this uh, flying from the beginning of May, whereas the other three won't start flying until July. So if you see what looks like a hawker species flying around earlier in the year, it's likely to be this hairy dragonfly. This is a pretty dragonfly, the brown hawker, which isn't that common in Wales. Just look at the camouflage of its abdomen, abdomen uh, against this sapling here. It's phenomenal, isn't it? But what makes it a brown hawker not only is the abdomen, but of course the brown tinge to the wings. Uh, and generally, as you see one of these flying past, you will be able to tell that it's a brown hawker because of its brown wings. Quite distinctive, really, regardless of what the other markings are. Those brown wings should tell you it's a brown hawker. Uh, distribution uh, across Wales isn't, at the moment, uh, that great. But it, these little black triangles, by the way, on these maps, show that it's gaining ground in these areas. So it's moving west. Uh, and, and these maps were from the uh, British survey by the British Dragonfly Society in 2016. So they're, they're slightly out of date, but it, it is moving westward. And so it's one you're likely to see in Wales more and more regularly. And this is the king of them all, the emperor dragonfly, beautiful dragonfly, widespread in Wales. This is the one that you'll often see patrolling up and down stretches of water, guarding its territory. Uh, it's the biggest and heaviest of our dragonflies. Not the longest, I'll come to that in a minute, but it's the biggest and heaviest. got the big, heavy thorax. Uh, this one was taken off Thrainyog, and I like this photograph especially when I took it because it's almost identical to the front cover of probably the most popular field guide with Richard Lewington's illustration here. Although you may notice that the, it's lost one of its rear wings, probably by a bird trying to predate it, the emperor dragonfly. It has a big heavy uh, thorax, but it also has this distinctive drooped abdomen. So again, if you see a big heavy bluish looking dragonfly patrolling up and down with this drooped abdomen, likely to be an emperor. Uh, and I suppose this is really one of uh, Northeast Wales's specialities. Certainly, you know, the Wrexham branch members have been to see this on the River Dee. It's a rare dragonfly nationally. It only frequents three river systems, the Severn, the Thames, and the Dee. So it likes fairly slow moving, uh, silted up rivers, uh, and its larvae spend the time amongst the silt on the river bottom. Uh, it was a subject of a BDS, the British Dragonfly Society survey a few years ago. So there's our own Johnny Holson there, uh, and Yuan. This is uh, Genevieve Daly from the British Damselfly uh, society that organized this and this great sculpture was put in place this is on on the river Dee banks near Holt Castle just on the border of uh, Cheshire and Wales uh, to mark the fact that you know it was a special place a special dragonfly location uh, and lots of people now in that area are going out specifically to look for it Club tails have what's called uh, synchronized emergence. So they all emerge pretty much uh, at the same time within a few days of each other. And as I said earlier, they'll, they'll disperse from the emergence site almost as soon as their wings are hard. This is a tenoral female. And you can see here particularly this opalescent milky uh, stage that they go through while the wings are hardening. This is a male. And because the, the wings haven't hardened and because they're um, just emerging, they can be quite docile and this is the best time to see them. So between 10 o'clock, if you want to go and have a little look, uh, it, it, sort of second to third week in May, 
uh, around Holt uh, on the River Dee is a good place to look for them. Uh, but late morning to midday is the best time to see them when they've just emerged, when they're hardening the wings off before they fly away. Uh, but photographing dragonflies on your fingers isn't always the most successful thing to do. Sometimes if they're out of focus, you can get other things in shot that you know you don't especially want to see really, but there we are, that's one of the, the joys of wildlife photography. Uh, and here you can see the, uh, the map, the distribution, because the Thames, the Severn and the Dee, very limited distribution. Uh, the survey found that it was doing quite well in places on the Thames. There's the, the Holt area, that black triangle there, that's doing quite well. Lots of places uh, where they expected to find it, they didn't. Uh, and they're still wanting to know, if you see it on the Welsh tributary, so on the Allen, for example, they're quite keen to know whether the Allen, as one of the Dee's tributaries, has still got this dragonfly. So if you're out and about uh, and you see it, Although they disperse, they, they, they're due to come back so around about now, really, to mate again. They come back in their pairs, of course, to mate, even though they've flown away from their emerging site. And their exuvia uh, are unique, really, because they live in silted, uh, the silted river bottoms, the, the, the larvae get covered with silt, so they're very distinctive. They're also distinctive because they emerge horizontally, almost every other species emerges onto vertical emerging vegetation um, but the club tail because they coming out of the river they'll emerge horizontally uh, and again it's the exuviae which um, will disturb the populations they do occasionally go a bit further and this one i found you know a little way up from the riverbank uh, on vegetation that's quite unusual this was uh, the exuvia that i collected as part of the survey and I wish I'd taken that photograph. I didn't. It won a competition. It's like something from Alien, isn't it? But it is, in fact, a club tail, uh, dams, uh, a club tail dragonfly emerging from its case. Wonderful photograph. So another little interlude. If you're getting a bit fed up with all this uh, ID stuff, I'll let you read this for yourself. And if we were in a hall with all you people sitting there, I know that the walls would just be resounding with laughter at the moment on that one. Moving on. The golden ring dragonfly, although it's not the largest in terms of weight, it's the longest dragonfly that we have. And this is very common and widespread in Wales because it's a species that uh, frequents running water again, particularly it likes fast flowing rivers. Uh, so there's lots of those in Wales. Uh, and because those rivers tend to be colder, the larva will uh, actually take longer to reach maturity, uh, sometimes three, four years, as opposed to two to three years of most of the other species. Four spotted chaser is incredibly common and a really nice dragonfly of all sorts of water bodies. Uh, and if you can count the spots on there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you can see why it's called the four spot chaser. Uh, these outer spots all dragonflies have even though they're not always dark colored they're called pterostigma uh, with a p at the beginning of that pterostigma uh, and they're thought to actually aid the dragonflies in their wonderful aerodynamic flight that they have somehow adding uh, um, you know an infinitesimal almost weight to the wing to assist them in their flight so it's these inner four dots which are particular to this dragonfly. That's why, although it looks like it's got eight, it's actually a four spotted chaser. Very common, lovely dragonflies. The other thing, by the way, about chasers is I photographed this one in my garden yesterday. Now that's a new pond, only built last year, uh, and although it stayed about four hours yesterday, uh, there was no females there, so it moved on. But the thing, the reason I got such a, what I think is quite a nice photograph of it, is that chasers, unlike the hawkers, are very compliant. So they like perching on, on overt stems, perhaps a dead stem of vegetation by the pond, and they'll return back to that stem time and time again. So if you see a chaser by the pond and you disturb it, just hang fire, stay there, and within a few minutes it'll return again so that you can photograph it. The males have this lovely powder blue uh, thorax, uh, abdomen, rather, and the females are uh, this 
brown and yellow color. Beautiful dragonflies, quite widespread. Now you won't see this one in Wales. This is a scarce chaser, which is a southeasterly, uh, southeast of the UK species. But the reason I've included these photographs is because these photographs demonstrate quite an interesting phenomenon. Uh, it, it's characterized this species by the pale blue eyes, by the way. But what we're looking at here is this mark on the abdomen. Dragonflies develop what's called pruinescence. And pruinescence is this uh, pale gray um, waxy substance that develops as, as the males particularly mature. And what you can see here on these photographs is where the females have grasped the abdomen in mating and they've rubbed off this pruinescence to reveal the main uh, texture of the abdomen underneath. So you know that this particular individual has already mated because of that pruinescence uh, that's, that's been moved. So quite interesting, I think. This is a, 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 a fairly common species, although still uh, gaining ground in terms of distribution in Wales, the black-tailed skimmer. So black on the uh, abdomen makes it quite an attractive species. The female, as always, uh, not as always, but in this species, uh, different to the male. There it is in tandem. And there's a female munching a blue bottle. And you can see perhaps why they get odonars and the toothed ones. Almost looks like Ken Dodd's teeth that they got there. So a very widespread species, but still looking to colonize parts of Wales. Now the keeled skimmer is one that many people think is, a, is an unusual species, but it's reasonably widespread in Wales itself. Uh, it's similar to the black-tailed skimmer, but it, the lower half of the abdomen, in fact, is, is still pale blue. Uh, and this is a westerly species, so again, people tend to think quite rare, but in Wales, whilst not that common, it's fairly widespread. Uh, and certainly you get it on the fens and marshes of, uh, of Anglesey, where I am at the moment. Common dart, as its name suggests, is common. Not all species are common uh, these days, are they? You know, common blues, common gulls aren't quite as common as you might expect, but common darters are. Uh, they are in, in tandem. They were seen in Marford Quarry when I was with the Wrexham brands. They were, in 2015, uh, a new pond was built in, uh, in Marford and one of our members uh, noticed that they overposited in the first year of the pond. The following summer, they were just so prolific. These are all the exuvia, many, many of them, that hatched out just after uh, a single year. So they certainly colonized new ponds very quickly. They also uh, are perhaps the most obvious dragonflies that adopt what's called this obelisk position, which is done simply to maximize the amount of sun that their bodies are uh, receiving. The black darter uh, is an acid loving, acid water loving species. So you get it, for example, on the Denbyshire Moors where there are ponds uh, and in sort of peat areas. But again, not that common, but fairly widespread uh, and quite an attractive uh, dragonfly. The white-faced darter is just about a Welsh species, uh, very rare nationally, um, but the Wixel moss, Fens and Bessfield mosses uh, have one of the strongest populations in the country. Indeed, larvae were taken from there to Delamere Forest in Cheshire, where there's an, a population being established. So again, they, they like uh, peaty, acidic ponds, uh, I just love the expression on that one's face. So, unlike me, if you can tell whether you're in Wales or England when you're on the uh, Wixel Moss complex, you're doing quite well. But technically, you should be able to see these in Wales. It's not the only white face species. The four spot chaser that we were looking at before does have a white face as well. But because the four spot chaser is just so distinctive and their habitats overlap, uh, you certainly get the four spot chaser in the same habitat as, as you find the white face. 
Uh, you should be able to tell them apart quite easily because the four spots is very distinctive. I'm moving on as we approach the end of this talk to some of these species, uh, like I mentioned initially, are starting to colonise the UK because of the climate change. The southern emerald damselfly has bred on a number of occasions and so has a, a sort of a weak foothold in the southeast of England, um, in, in Suffolk and Sussex particularly. Uh, and that may well uh, prove to be uh, a, a stronger coloniser as time goes on. The southern migrant hawker that's distinguished by these beautiful blue eyes, uh, similarly, and, and this, this fly is more widespread but hasn't yet mated uh, and bred in many locations other than the southeast. The lesser emperor, I photographed this in France, it's a common continental species. Uh, distinguished by this blue saddle that it has uh, on its thorax. Uh, again, has bred in a number of locations towards the south of England and, and is, is moving forward. The vagrant emperor. Now, you may remember last February, we had a bit of a heat wave. And here in Anglesey, people were swimming on the beach in, in mid-February. Uh, and at the same time, there was an influx of vagrant emperors that had come in from those southerly winds that brought the warm weather. Uh, and vagrant emperors were, were photographed all over the place, including here in Anglesey uh, in, in mid-February. Uh, again, they bred sporadically, but uh, they fly far and wide, but uh, hopefully will become a resident UK species before too long. The red veined darter is one of a couple of darter species, again, very common on the continent. Anyone who's been on holiday in France, for example, will see these all over the place, along with the yellow winged darter uh, and the scarlet darter, which is quite distinctive. So these are all common species on the continent starting to make their way into the UK. And I'm going to mention, uh, finally, one that's uh, breeding quite regularly now in the southeastern corner, in Suffolk particularly. Uh, and this is another emerald species, so it holds its wings out in that spread wing position rather than parallel. But what's interesting about the willow emerald is that even in the winter, you can see where it's bred because it leaves these distinctive scars. Uh, it actually oviposits from, a, you know, the femur has a blade at the bottom of the abdomen, uh, cuts a little um, a break into, into the, the willow twigs, uh, and lays its eggs there and leaves this row of scars. And it's spreading steadily throughout the UK. So if you're on your holidays later on when we're all allowed out, perhaps, you know, even towards the Midlands now, I think it's beginning to spread. But it, 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 it's one of those species that is moving, moving on at a pace. All these creatures, all these Odonata, uh, as we said at the start, you know, suffering from all sorts of things, habitat loss, uh, as well as predation, uh, you'll always see uh, signs of, of their demise and sometimes even if the larvae has been damaged in the pond through, through predators or whatever, they can actually be damaged as they, as they emerge, as they hatch out. Uh, birds will take their toll, so there's a spotted flycatcher with a damselfly and I wish I'd taken this photograph but Hobby is a renowned of course for feeding primarily uh, on, on dragonflies at certain times of the year. Uh, and 20, 30 of them at a time can be seen at, at Wixel Moss, um, late July, early August. They'll also uh, be cannibalistic. So here's an emperor dragonfly predating uh, another, another hawker. So they you know, have to run the gauntlet of many different uh, challenges. So if you want to help them, the British Dragonfly Society is always welcome uh, to have new members. Uh, and finally, if you are particularly interested in, uh, and you don't have these things already, and you want to uh, read a bit more about this fascinating group of insects, there's a couple of field guides. This one has the uh, Richard Lewington illustrations, which are just superb. Uh, and these wild guides, the photographic guides, which I don't know if you're familiar with, but they're, they're producing more and more of these. They're excellent photographic rather than illustrated guides. Well worth a look. But also, some of you may know of Patrick Barkham's book on butterflies, um, where he went around the country trying to see every drag, every butterfly in the country in 12 months. 
this is its companion volume, not by Richard Barkham, uh, sorry, Patrick Barkham. This one's by Marianne Taylor, but it's, um, it's a, an interesting book where she goes around the country trying to see all of the British species, just like Patrick Barkham tried to see the butterfly species. So that, that, that's worth a read. Uh, and this is an interesting book by Rory Mackenzie Dodds. Uh, he was the son-in-law of Miriam Rothschild, so came from quite a, a sort of a, a privileged uh, family life. Uh, and he started the Dragonfly Centre in, uh, in Cambridgeshire, Wiccan Fen in Cambridgeshire, which unfortunately was closed down last year. Uh, the, the site itself was owned by the National Trust, who allowed the centre to, uh, to be developed there. But unfortunately, the National Trust decided that it needed the site back for its own purposes. So uh, at the moment, it's closed down. Uh, and I think people are looking to see where, where they might open another one. But uh, as a story about dragonflies and how uh, Rory Mackenzie Dodds particularly went about trying to support and uh, influence the public to support them, it's a fascinating read. So four books worth reading to finish off with, and I think that's coming up to the hour. And there we are, Mark, done and dusted. Thank you very much.